Hi, everybody, and welcome to Deep in the Bush. Today, very excited to be joined by Damien Mander, fellow Australian who has lived one of the more exciting lives, the kind of lives most people can only imagine, and perhaps some uh, haven't even considered to do that. Damien joined the Australian Defence Force as a teen, became a naval clearance diver, which I had to look up what that actually involves, and it's quite an extraordinary field, both underwater mapping, mine clearance, mine laying, and, and so much more. I'm sure you can complete that, Damien. Before becoming a sniper, a military contractor in Iraq, and ultimately bringing those skills to Africa during a period of dissatisfaction to set up something called the International Anti-Poaching Foundation. They were doing extraordinary work, which we would like to talk a bit about during this episode. So, Damien, welcome, and what a fantastic backdrop you've got. I mean, I've got pictures of wilderness. You're actually in it. Very, very envious. Thanks, Peter. G'day, mate. Thanks very much for having us. Good to uh, have a chat with a fellow Aussie. Yeah. It's if been a while for me. Like, you... is that... Oh, I, I do, particularly if rugby's on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you must know what it's like if you're an Australian living in Africa and you're the lone person in a pub when the rugby's on. Uh, that's where I would have needed Kiwis, your skills. The South Africans, uh, the Argentinians all support our own team and anyone that's playing England. Yeah. My well, wife said losing, losing to New Zealand is like your little brother beating you in an arm wrestle. And losing to England is like when it, you're losing to your granddad. Either, either one's pretty horrible. <laughs> it could be worse. You, you, you could lose to South Africa and get caught with uh, yellow pieces of sandpaper on uh, national television. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I was telling people I was a Kiwi for a year after that. <laughs> I just discovered I am a Kiwi. Well, sheer fluke. It turns out I've been a Kiwi citizen my whole life and didn't know it. Okay. They, they automatically give it to you if you've got a New Zealand parent. But um, on to far more interesting things than my heritage. Um, why don't you just tell us in your own words, IAPF, what it is and what its aims are. Yeah, so we set up uh, 2009 initially just myself. Uh, going around as a service provision uh, training rangers. So, I mean, my background, having come from Iraq, working with training Iraqi National Police and Special Police, came over here and saw, saw a need for that, uh, particularly at a time when the Rhino Wars was starting. And I suppose, rightly or wrongly, mil uh, conservation was becoming increasingly militarised. Uh, I think for two reasons. One, because people thought it had to, and two, through frustration. Uh, and so I sort of fell into step with with where industry was going then, uh, couldn't get a job uh, or a paying job with anyone initially or eventually, so I just set up uh, set up an organisation myself, the International Anti Poaching Foundation, and uh, we just grew from there. Uh, started taking on more and more contracts uh, as a service provider, uh, scaled up to take on management of, of areas, uh, wide scale areas. Um, the biggest one we took on eventually by 2015 was along the border of. Kruger National Park, but on the Mozambique side of the border, uh, protecting up to a third of the world's remaining rhino population uh, and, and an area that was accounting for 70% of rhino deaths that were happening on the planet each year. Uh, the piece of land that we were controlling uh, separated a majority of the world's rhino poaching syndicates and uh, a third of the world's rhino population. So uh, it, it was ground zero uh, for, for rhino poaching and, and what we deemed to be the most important piece of land on the, on the, on the planet for rhino conservation. Uh, we set up, uh, you know, essentially a ground level offensive there against the local population. Uh, we had 165 personnel, four different government departments, aeroplanes, helicopters, uh, big offences, and more guns. And we we stopped poachers from coming through. Uh, in the process, repeating all the same mistakes we made in Iraq. And um, well, wow. yeah, I did, you know, I mean, I, I, I'd gotten to a point where I was spending a lot of time lecturing around the world, and I, I literally used to start my talks by saying, "I know what we're doing is not not the answer. Just just think of us and what we're doing as a paramedic trying to get this situation to the operating table uh, until fi someone finds a better solution." That's um, so that that's, was. Uh, what, what do, you think? Yeah. Do, you, do you feel you you're arriving at a better solution now, or are you still triaging? No, no. In 2017, we 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 left Mozambique. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd actually been out of Zimbabwe for a couple of years. Uh, I didn't come back until 2015, and we started scoping new projects here again. Uh, so my focus had been down in South Africa and Mozambique. Uh, 
but I wanted to come back to Zimbabwe and, and try and make a go of things here. You know, it was a country where I first started a <laughs> conservation career. It's a country, country that I fell in love with. And, uh, yeah, it was just a matter of trying to find something to work, but something that was different uh, on a continent that's going to have 2 billion people by 2040. Uh, you know, we were des- desperate to find a solution that was 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 not where conservation was going uh not what everyone else was doing in terms of the militarization and uh that's that's essentially where we fell into the the two programs that we do now uh which is so essentially all we do as an organization now is 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 two programs one is called akashinga and that's land management Mm -hmm. Uh, so we have a portfolio of reserves uh, currently 10 reserves under contract from anywhere from 20 to 45 years uh, these are all former trophy hunting reserves, uh, areas that uh, have been left abandoned in the wake of a, a declining trophy hunting industry. These are areas that would be lost to human settlement, illegal mining or agriculture uh, if we didn't find a use for them. And, and, and this is something that I, you know, we, we're looking at all national parks. You go to a national park and it could be dozens of, of different NGOs fighting to do different bits and pieces in there, whatever it may be. Uh, and we wanted to go where there was nothing. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. And I suppose in my, in my own heart, from a conservation standpoint, the lost causes are the best ones worth fighting for. Uh, and yeah. So that's, that's essentially what, what you know, we, we're holding on, to, holding on to what would otherwise disintegrate. And, and in a world where, you know, there's an increasing push to put a, set aside half of the planet for nature. Uh, I think we currently have about 70% of the Earth's surface set aside for nature and we need 50 to stop our acceleration to the sixth mass great extinction. Uh, holding on to places like this is what is what became important to me. Um, it's, it's really interesting you mentioned that fifty percent because that's something which I'm hearing more and more. I'm I'm, fa- I'm so pleased that more and more people are talking about. It. Obviously, we're in that same bubble, that conservation bubble, from very different sides. I'm, my obviously my experience is in tourism, and you are on the literal front line of conservation where it is armed conflict. Uh, which is pretty far from luxury tented safaris, which is where I've spent most of my time in conservation. But that is still remains the same bubble. And I think it's really important that people outside the, this bubble that we're in realise there is a push with really good science behind it to have half the world protected. Yeah, and that could be done. That could be done cynically by just preserving big chunks of the ocean because there's so much of it. Yeah, but it true. does need to be places that sustain large areas of life or huge areas of endemic species. And I mean, Zimbabwe has was just it was kind of the Uganda of the southern part of Africa. It was so fertile. It was just so wealthy, and I'm not just talking wealth. Just just good soils. A farmer friend of mine once said, "Just throw a seed here, and you're going to have fruit in a year." Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, amazing, amazing land, and obviously, I mean, uh, nobody needs a lesson in what's gone wrong there. So, to be able to recover these places, like you said, the lost causes, that the land is there, the the, the capacity to grow trees, the plants, the, the grazing, the animals need. So, really exciting what you're doing. Um, got a few questions for you here, just just more about you in a bit. It's a bit like an, an inkblot test of, of words. Um, obviously, I didn't send these through to you, but this is a, kind of a, a bit of a standard on Deep in the Bush that we ask people some of these same questions, a few unique to you. Yeah. Who's your conservation hero? Uh, J- Jane Goodall is not only a, a hero to me, but she's a, been a personal mentor, and I think Jane, what, what Jane represents to me is that conservation isn't a hobby or it's a pastime or a phase of your life but it's a lifelong commitment and i think you know at a time in in, in history where civilization has been brought to its knees by a small scaly anteater uh, we've yeah. got to realize we're not the main act you know we may yeah. think we are but but uh you know this planet's been spinning for over five billion years and survived a lot worse than these humans and will continue to do so and unless we start to look up to people like jane and not people that can kick a soccer ball around better than the other person or someone that makes a bunch of money because they're, they're spinning some shit on Instagram. Unless we start to, the kids really start to look up to, to people like Jane and, and, and try to emulate the lives that they lead, then, you know, we're going to continue heading down this, this, 
the, the wrong path that we have been going down as, as, a, as a selfish species. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that on the back end of COVID, we, we're going to have a wake-up call. And just before COVID hit, you know, you started to see all this momentum gaining ground and climate change and more and more people talking about it and government starting to jump up and down. Who knows if it's going to be enough uh, in, in, in the time we have. But, uh, yeah, to answer your question, Jane, I mean, she's the patron of our, of our, of our organisation. She's the head of our advisory board and... She's someone that I very much enjoy whiskey with and I catch up with. Yeah, I, I've also had the pleasure of a few too many drinks with her. Um, we drank a magnum of cheap Chilean red in Bolivia once. <laughs> what a life highlight. <laughs> okay, so any extinct species, any point in history, you could bring it back. What would you choose? Ah, oh, jeez. <laughs> Australia used to have a massive wombat. The yeah, of a the protodon. The pro the protodon. I can see yeah. one of those running around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, it wasn't that long ago. It was most yeah. likely human influence. I mean, in, like you, you spoke about how old the Earth is, billions of years. It was probably forty to 50,000 yeah. years ago we lost it. So yeah. there's the habitat there. Yeah. Okay, so in Australia, what we call a ute, our American friends call it a pickup, um, I'm not sure what they call it here in England, where I'm. If you've got one of those in Australia, you know every weekend somebody says, "Oh, I know this is a pain, but can you just help me move my fridge?" The moment you own a pickup, everyone's here. With your skill set, do your friends phone me up and say, "Damien, can you give me a handy? I've got to kill someone." <laughs> what did you get that? Um. Yeah, I mean, I I do have a certain skill set. <laughs> I also <laughs> spent spent a lot of money uh training me to to fulfill but um yeah not something that i've, I've my skills are better used uh in other places these days uh, and you know my, my weapons of choice these days are a keyboard and a steering wheel uh you know i spent a lot of time lecturing around the world um, on the nat geo circuit and get an, a lot of opportunities to be in front of schools and kids and universities uh, as well as captive audiences that already have a, a, a an interest in conservation i think that's uh that's the best use of my skills these days, that with trying to raise funds and, and focus on the strategy and the vision of the organisation and where we're going. Uh, so had a very interesting trip uh, to Mozambique, uh, the expansion of our Akashinga model uh, into coastal and maritime conservation for me to go home to the ocean. Uh, it's an exciting thing. Uh, I do miss it. I mean, I love you're, you're, from, you're, you're from Victoria, right, in Australia? Yeah. Uh, yeah. From, from the coast or are you... Yeah, I am. Yeah, but also spent a yeah. bunch of years in in Sydney uh, on the coast as well. So, okay. but uh, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, really, where my career started in the military, it came from from my love for initially free diving and then scuba diving and then into the military, and then that led on to special operations, led on to Iraq, led on to Africa. So, for did me, you, you know, did you, you ever treat a platypus, HMAS platypus? Uh, no, uh, it was HMAS penguin. That's where uh, all the the clearance okay. divers were trained. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I used to live right by platypus, which is why I was asking. Um, but so, <laughs> what are the top 10 vegetarian restaurants in Victoria Falls? <laughs> Mate, I, I, well, I'm not there at the moment. I, I, I would rank my cooking uh, uh, as the top 10. I could cook 10 dishes better than any other restaurant could cook vegan there uh, in Victoria Falls. I love it. I know. And actually, actually, when I set up when I set up IAPF, I had the, the paperwork filled out to go and study catering down at Silwood in, uh, in Cape Town and then uh, fortunately decided wow. that um, I prefer cooking for 10 people than 500 people and that uh, conservation would be, be a better use of uh, my next so career. You, you were angling towards chefing or cooking rather than... Yeah, yeah. I wow. Watched a, okay. Uh, I, um, I watched a uh, Anthony Bourdain uh, episode yeah. in São Paulo in Brazil uh, on a plane over to Iraq uh, when I was heading over for for one of my last tours and just thought, you know, this looks exciting and exotic, and you get to travel. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, of course, of you, course, you yeah, were stuck in the back of a kitchen sweating it out without your own television show. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I love that you thought that that looked exciting after the life you were living. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, so you have, what if the carrots are late? <laughs> There's the thrill of the day. 
Um, but my wife actually said to me earlier that I'm mean to vegans. And the funny thing is she's a vegetarian and I'm edging closer and closer to it. And I'm actually not. I know I make jokes about them, but it's it's about the, um, the almost evangelical way that often it's approached rather than veganism itself. I'm, I'm entirely yeah. supportive. And so do you, do you find that people go, oh, would you shut up about veganism? Oh, look, I, I mean, I used to, I used to give uh, vegans and vegetarians a lot of shit, and I, and, I, and I found that I traced that back to my own insecurities uh, mm-hmm. about, um, about what they were saying to me and, and how that clashed with my own ideologies and what I was not willing to let go. Uh, and, you know, I mean, especially, you know, I mean, some of the guys I hang around with are, you know, fairly hard-hitting guys, ex-special forces and, and, and Navy divers and, and all that. And it's, you know, I mean, it's very, you know, even in the conservation industry, it's, you know, people, people will uh, feel uncomfortable about it. But, I mean, ultimately, I mean, as an alpha male, I don't want to, I don't want to do something to something else that can't defend itself. And I don't want to pay someone else to do it for me. And essentially, that's that's what it came down to for me. And you know, I mean, sitting down and and you know, I'm, well, I, I spent all day out in the bush protecting one group of animals, and coming home and eating yeah. another group of animals. And then and then, I mean, that's from that's from the ethical standpoint in, in terms of taking a life. And uh, but when you come down from a conservation standpoint, I mean, we get into conservation because we love we love animals and we love the environment, and and. Uh, I mean, the meat industry is the greatest killer of animals on this planet, and, and it's the greatest destroyer of our, our environment on this planet. Uh, mm. And I mean, m- most of the land that's, that's lost through deforestation is lost uh, through the livestock or to grow grain that will feed livestock. Yeah. So look, it was just and, and look. I mean, people can say, "Oh, what about this organic or that organic or fucking what, what, what?" And in the end, you know, you just don't want to be sick, sitting and picking and choosing and and. Uh, you know, it's just better to go blanket and say, you know, this is this is it. And I mean, I never really cared about the health side or the, the health aspect. A lot of people do that, um, but for me, it was just it was more this eth- ethical and environmental side. And so, yeah, people can hang shit on me, and that that's that's cool. Um, you know, it's it's a uh, you know, and I'll, I'll continue having the conversations because I remember when the people used to have conversations with me. And it felt to them like they were speaking to a brick wall, but but in actual fact, they were chipping mm-hmm. away at the the armor of ego that I had around myself that was blocking myself out from hearing the truth. And but essentially, once the shutters come up, they never go down again. Yeah, that's I'm coming to the same thing. It's uh, environmental rather in your understanding what it takes to produce a kilo of beef, and it just yeah. it's, well, I, my daily life, my my work life. My personal life, I'm really trying my utmost to help animals, and it's well, clearly yeah. I'm not I finish it off with a steak dinner. Uh, but obviously, yeah. people come in their own way. But um, okay, yeah. so question: any phobias? Um, you know, with the military, I mean, I never enjoyed heights, hey, but it never stopped me doing anything. Uh, you know, it was, uh, I'll tell you another good one in a minute. Um, but uh, I mean, we were jumping out of choppers into places, out of places, uh, sliding down cable through eleva- elevator shifts down 17 floors and just shit that I used to cringe over, you know, forward run down buildings and, yeah, just forward rappelling down buildings and, yeah, I just be like, oh, God, yeah. God. <laughs> it's just not, not the fun part of the job. It looks cool in the movies, but uh, so it never stopped me from doing it. I think the other, my other phobia is I can't fucking touch velvet. Peach skin, you know, the back of like silver photo frames. It's like kryptonite. Can't touch velvet. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm only laughing because I, I understand. Getting crazy that. thinking about it. I I get it because I'm I'm afraid of heights. I'm afraid of crocodiles. I think they're both reasonable fears. Recently got a bamboo toothbrush, and the feeling of that in my mouth was as if I was tasting fingers down a blackboard. There was just something with it. It was horrible. <laughs> I've worked through it. I've refused to, to give it up, but it's every single time. It's, I'm going to be full of cavities pretty soon. I hate that thing. Okay, right. If poaching stopped tomorrow, what would you do? Yeah. Probably take a few weeks off, mate, to be honest. <laughs> uh, Back down to chef school. Been going, I've been going at it pretty hard for the, um, for the last 11, 12 years, hey? Um, mm mm-hmm. You know, and I've, I mean, I've said, I mean, we've got such a good team around us now. We've got uh, well over 200 staff. 
really good management team. Uh, and I've sort, I'm at a point now where I'm, I'm not the guy sitting there doing everything from designing the posters for the fundraiser to you know, writing the copy for the press release so I can actually come up to 30,000 feet and uh, you know, spend a lot of time with the vision and the strategy, going around having the meetings, uh, you know, political levels, uh, doing the conferences mm-hmm. and the speaking, the media side of things, but, but also just, just working with a very small uh, senior management team and uh you know so that's i mean that's it's it's actually really rewarding the last couple of years is the first time that i've really had time to breathe and, and really enjoy this uh i mean if poaching finished tomorrow i mean I, my simple response would be oh, it's unfortunately it's never going to be and i think that's what yeah. that's what i respect about so many people in the industry they're fighting about something that they know will, will, will never be won and it's it's just something that we have to keep fighting for because, uh, you know, we sleep at night knowing the situation would be much worse if we weren't all doing what we're doing. Yeah. It's something I've, I've compared to either gardening or even exercising. Just having weeded the yard doesn't mean the weeds are coming back. Yeah. And similarly, you can't go to the gym once and leave it at that. Uh, it just yeah. keeps going on. Conservation lasts forever well, as long as there are humans stirring the earth. Um, okay, so you've lived the video game of a life. We've talked, you're jumping out of helicopters, vertical, repelling. Um, there would be a hell of a lot of teenage guys in particular going, that sounds amazing, I want to do that. And then I can turn it to good and you know, start shooting at poachers, fantastic. Yeah. What advice would you give the teenage boy that you were? Uh, you know, I, I was sort of... Um... You know, I, I would have classified myself as a selfish person growing up. You know, I had to join the military more for adventure than to serve my country. Iraq was for money, not for the cause, and, and Africa was for the fight, not for not for trying to do something constructive here initially. And it was the, the process of going through and working with rangers and seeing what was happening here that, that made me realise there's more to life than, than about doing things for oneself. And, and, I, and I suppose it actually becomes infectious once you start doing... That's the strange thing about it too. When you're trying to do things for yourself, uh, like it might look fancy, or uh, you know, other people look at it and go, "Shit, that looks cool." But it, it, it's actually when you start doing things for others uh, and, and and service that you really start to feel good about yourself. And in that way, it becomes even more selfish because you're doing something for someone else, and it makes you feel <laughs> yeah. better about yourself than what doing shit for yourself in the first place makes you feel like. So, um, you know, I I was also you know. I don't, you know, in a way, I don't understand like a violent person when I was young, uh, you know, and it's just, um, you know, even, you know, I used to go hunting uh, with some sort of okay. form of uh, trying to get primal respect from my peers. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, to a point where I'm now, you know, like, I mean, I'm, I might still have all the tattoos and, and uh, about 250 pounds behind me, but it's, it's a fairly placid dude, uh, you know, yeah. just trying to yeah. focus on h- how to approach conservation in the most non-violent ways. Um, all, all, is the majority that, of is all that our... age, age or the accumulation of experiences or is it yeah, I mean, we, we, we're, we're all a product of our, our own past eh? and, and I mean, you can't, you can't send someone on, on the same journey to, to discover themselves. Everyone's got to have their own journey, but you know, I suppose I always, I always managed to do things that, that very few other people were able to get into, you know, elite military units and then to be able to stick things out in Zimbabwe as a foreigner when, when uh, you know, people come and go. And I, I suppose, you know, the, you, know, you know, a lot of people will look at where we are and, and say we've become very successful uh, and I feel successful in terms of what I've set out to achieve in my life. And, and essentially the only, the only thing I can put that down to is perseverance. Uh, you know, when everybody else around you said it's too hard or can't be done, I'm saying fuck that. I- I'm going to stick around, and uh, yeah. and that's that's pretty much it. Hey, uh, the rest will figure itself out. Just fucking hang in there, uh, because while you're hanging in there, everyone else is is taking off. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the the old saying, "History's made by people who turn up." Uh, you probably yeah. add a little bit to that, and it's uh, history's changed by the people that stick with it. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. so. It, there's actually something you mentioned there, and it goes back to a bit of what you are saying previously about the political meetings and so on. Uh, I, I admire greatly what your teams are doing, what you've done, but what absolutely blows my mind that in several countries where the governments 
their default level is paranoia. That's when they're most relaxed. They're what we would call very paranoid. Yeah. You as a foreigner and a white foreigner have been given permission to bring military skills to these, these groups of, of now it's, is it entirely women? Is everybody you're training women? Uh, so all the field <laughs> staff, all, all the community liaison and officers, yeah, the majority of our staff, more than 70% of our staff are women. Uh, we've got... Um, and so is there a secret you can share with people, how you, how you convince a guy? That's got to be, to my mind, one of the greatest diplomatic or sales jobs I've ever, ever heard of. <laughs> uh, look, it hasn't been without. It's, it's heartbreaking. Um, uh you know, setbacks, uh, having invested my life savings here. I, I did reasonably well from a, from a soldier's standpoint in residential property uh, back in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, also had some apartments in Dubai, liquidated that, that to, uh, over, over some time to set up the organisation. Uh, 2012, the Australian newspaper, our version of the Washington Post, ran a front page story about um, Australian special operations spies working in Zimbabwe and Kenya. Um, I was out of the country at the time, asked to come back uh, and answer questions in regards to espionage, um, and it took me two and a half years to be able to clear my name and return to the country. Um, living in a backpackers in Kempton Park in Johannesburg with uh, a couple of thousand bucks left in my name, literally started from scratch. Uh, able to come back here, set up, uh, set up the programs that we set up, which were completely different to, to what we had done or essentially what had been done in conservation before. Uh, a network of abandoned trophy hunting reserves managed and protected by women. And, uh, you know, we got a lot of positive pre press for Zimbabwe. Uh, and I say women also. Women, w women change the way that governments look at conservation because women naturally de-escalate tension with local communities. Uh, they have a different yeah. value systems, which means conservation itself becomes demilitarized. So the decisions that governments often have to make between uh, conservation and community isn't there. They're, a, they're, they're able to back both at the same time. And in that respect, women became the bridge that conservation and communities had to build between each other again. And uh, I mean, we, we are at a point now, uh, uh, President Manigagwa's daughter is, is a volunteer ranger with us. Uh, we, you know, we have very good, um, I would say, political equity uh, in the country. It's not to say that it's still not a challenge. There's a number of different departments of different individuals and different characters that we, we're always dealing with. Uh, but essentially, I think we've we've gotten past the point where there's any sort of question as that you know if we're we're here for an ulterior motive. Uh, you know, we're we're into our twelfth year of operation now. Uh, we've got a lot of success on the board. We work quite yeah. closely with a number of government agencies, and but uh, yeah, look, I, I mean, I, I get an email a day from someone who I used to be uh, twelve years ago saying they want to come over here and get involved with conservation and. You know, you know, bring their own weapons and all that. And it's just, you know, it's, I mean, when I came over, I, I was initially shocked that nobody, you know, everybody didn't want to employ me. And, uh, you know, because I had all these skills. And it wasn't until you go and sit with the people around the campfire and see the heartache and investment they put in over decades of their life to get to the positions that they were, were in that they didn't want to jeopardise that with some foreigner coming in looking for uh, his next, next set of pictures on social media. Yeah. No, no, I completely understood. And I understand the perspective. Again, having been in the tourism side and play, you know, the company I work for now, Natural Selection, we've gone into several areas that people have said, <clears throat> that's, that's bad land, there's nothing you can do with it. Yeah. But we deliberately chose places adjacent to communities rather than deep, well-protected yeah. reserves. Yeah. And the first thing, the very first thing you do is don't bother clearing the snares, don't bother doing this. Go and talk to the community and ask what they want. Yeah. Uh, and I think the younger version of you that was probably ready to, to pull the trigger would have actually exacerbated the issue yeah. rather yeah, than, than help. Um, and I, I think so. Yeah. Actually, leads lead me to, uh, perhaps lead me to the next question I've got is, what's a myth about anti-poaching? Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose the, the one myth is the one that I, I, I lived through, uh, and that's the need for the militarization of conservation to be able to, to hold on. Look, there's, there's a need for escalation in law enforcement when you're dealing with areas uh, that are, I mean, I mean we're in the, the mid to lower Zambezi here, uh, 8,000 elephants lost between 2001 and 2016. That's 8,000 times armed poachers coming into this area. But 
uh, <clears throat> you know, versus the militarized operation we ran, excuse me, along the border of, of Mozambique there, uh, our approach here uh, in employing women, uh, as I said, naturally de-escalate tension, uh, invest almost three times of their salary uh, back in family and local community than what a male does. Fantastic at collecting information. Um, and, you know, they spend their money on, on things like building houses, buying land, getting their kids back into school. It's, it's, it turns conservation funding into the most effective form of community development funding, which is women's empowerment. And in, in that respect, we yeah. found a way uh, to achieve a conservation outcome by reversing the way that we look at conservation. We put women's empowerment at the center of the strategy, giving the greatest traction in community development with conservation becoming the byproduct. We actually cut our core operating budget by two thirds per acre per annum. Wow. Uh, so we don't have we don't have helicopters or aircraft or military grade hardware. Uh, and so in that respect, you know, the myth that I had in my own mind of, of how conservation had to be done is, has been completely shifted on its head. That's that's fascinating because you, you so what you've got is a low tech, high EQ yeah. response that's that you you're you're saying. I mean that's a lot more effective. To me it just makes immediate sense that that would be so much more effective. Um, yeah. but, Okay, so then what is the truth about anti-poaching? Maybe you've already answered it, that people should know. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to harp on the same point before, but it, it's, it's, I mean, this is an ongoing thing. But anti-poaching isn't, isn't, a, isn't a, a standalone activity. It, it's, it's, uh, it's not even a silo in, within conservation. It's something that has to be overlapping with, with community development, uh, de uh, demand mm. reduction in Asia, uh, targeting yeah. uh, illegal wildlife crime networks, uh, working with uh, landscape management plans across multiple agencies and even across international borders. Uh, so anti-poaching is, is a piece of a, a much larger jigsaw puzzle. Uh, education within schools, uh, not only here in Africa, but, uh, but across the world. Being able to shift uh, you know, the perspective of donors, uh, international donors, whether they're behind net worth individuals, uh, small donors, governments, but shifting the scale of, of our level invest of investment into conservation. Uh, at the moment in the US, about 5% per about five of philanthropic funding uh, uh, goes to, or if you combine all environmental causes and animal causes, both domestic and wild, uh, and climate change. Uh, the other ninety-five percent of philanthropic funding goes to humanitarian causes, with about thirty-three yeah. percent of that to religion. So we've we've got to shift the way, and I'm not saying we have to flip it completely, but we have to shift the way that we we look at ourselves as the centre of the universe, and realise that we are part of a, a much bigger machine. Uh, we're, we're, we're part a of fri a frightening uh, little counter to that stat. There is more money is given to ballet than is given to wildlife in the US. <laughs> There you go, um, and yeah, and that is that is all wildlife, not just U.S. centric yeah. wildlife globally, uh, and that is both commercial and personal donations. It's quite terrifying. Yeah. As you said, living in the age of COVID, which has come about because of a disrespect for nature, harvesting yeah. wild, and you'd think surely this should flip on its head. Yeah, um, it's crazy. Okay, so slightly different tack here. Yeah. Um, and it, you touched again a little, little on this, trophy hunting. Is that good for wildlife? Look, I mean, from a, from a practical... Open. Sorry? It's a can of worms being opened. No, that's fine, hey. Uh, you know, I get asked this quite a bit. And, and, and uh, so there's, there's two sides to trophy hunting. There's a person that gets on the plane and fr flies across to shoot the animal. And mm -hmm. that's the person I used to be. Uh, that's the person that I, I feel is desperate for uh that prime respect someone that is 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 in search of having the ego stroked uh and i i know it because it used to be me um yeah. then there's the other side and that's the, the hunting operator on the ground where hunting is not necessarily a pastime it's an income stream uh, and these are people that in, in many cases have made large areas work on a shoestring uh for for, for decades or generations um but with the decline of the trophy hunting industry, and this is, this is actually an environmental disaster across the continent that many people are not talking about or not enough people are talking about. 
you've got a decline in trophy hunting due to shrinking wildlife populations uh, across key, ecos key ecosystems. You've got uh, shifting uh, policy and regulations surrounding the export of, of trophies mm -hmm. such as uh, ivory from countries like Zimbabwe to the United States. That was 52% of the clientele when the US Fish and Wildlife uh, Service switched that off. And then you've got a younger generation raised on social media that just doesn't want to get on a plane and fly across here to do the shooting anymore. Uh, and what that means is the income stream that's coming to so many areas is no longer there and then these areas are, are going to be lost. So we wanted to look at hunting not as an argument to be had, more as an equation to be solved. Uh, the pilot area, the place that I'm sitting at here at the moment, uh, Fundundu Wildlife Area, uh, we can sit down on paper uh, with the local community and show them that we're putting the same amount into the community every 34 days is what trophy hunting was doing per annum uh, when, it, uh, when it finished here. And is so, that sustainable and, though? Is that donor money or is that well, something actual revenue? It's donor money, but the, the, the four revenue streams that we get funding from is a far bigger market space than, than what trophy hunting is. Trophy hunting is mm -hmm. just over $200 million a year in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we, we've got um, uh, animal rights funding being an economic alternative to trophy hunting. As, you, as, as people will chuckle, um, funding from the vegan and plant-based movement, it's the largest growing food sector in the United States, which is our, our biggest market yeah. space for fundraising, uh, traditional conservation funding, uh, and then women's empowerment, two and a half times for women's empowerment, two, two and a half times more money uh, in Africa for women's empowerment than what there is for conservation. So uh, we've been able, uh, able to open ourselves up to those different market spaces. A, a trophy hunter or a trophy hunting operator relies on selling an option to someone to come over and shoot that animal. We rely on selling an opportunity to someone to invest in us to protect those animals. Now, both of those things rely on the same thing to sell the story, and that's marketing. Uh, and we have a much easier story to sell. Yeah, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm really excited to hear that. Um, so, because um, I, listen, I, I personally I cannot comprehend being the person that wants to fly over, shoot an elephant. And but I, what I find even more offensive than that is when they're saying it's for the environment. It's like, no, it's not. Like you said, it's for the no. ego. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no, it, it it definitely is. And and the, the thing is. Within any industry, the tougher things get, the more corners people are going to cut. And uh, I mean, you look at you know people are coming over and they say, "Oh, we're just shooting the big old one that you know can't eat anymore, can't defend themselves anymore." I can tell you, yeah, that may have been the case in certain circumstances many years ago, but in today's world, that's bullshit. Well, it's also the, the increasing that we know what value that old elephant has in elephant society, which is yeah. incredibly complex. Yeah. Also, the idea that oh, we shoot lions that are past their prime. And male lion past his prime has got about two weeks to live, typically. Yeah, and he's all yeah. up. The male lion past his prime has just had the crap beaten out of him. He's not going to look good on your wall. Yeah. He's been out of his territory and he's going to get killed by the guy that lives in that one if he yeah. wasn't killed. Right. So how they're finding it in that two weeks, it is uh, what the Romans called Taurus excreta. It's through and through. Um, I'm not saying, as you said, you've got these guys who've had the choice of agriculture or hunting, that land has been of some value to conservation for that alone. Yeah. But it would be as if you t had said to me, I'm so into creating jobs for women, I've decided to become a pimp. I'd go, yeah, yeah, I'm not, that's how you're exactly. really doing yeah. it, Damien. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, not, that's not the real yeah. reason, is it? So, yeah. yeah. Um, the, fl the flip side of this argument is if the world is, is as against trophy hunting as what they make out to be, then they should put their hand in their pocket and invest in alternative uh, yeah. uh, income streams for these areas, uh, because okay, then, then, as then. much as much as I as much as I dislike the idea of hunting, uh, I will say this: when hunting is working in an area, and then all of a sudden it stops working, the anti poaching unit disappears, the management disappears, the fence yeah. comes down, the trees get chopped, the rivers stop flowing, animals are poached. There's nothing left there, and so it, it, it's not like you can just say, "All right, we hate hunting, we're going to switch it off." It's like, okay, what are we going to replace hunting with? And that's yes. that's the discussion yeah. that needs to be happening. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree with you 100% on that. And, and like you, I mean, particularly where you're living, you meet a lot of people that actually run these operations and they don't have horns and cloven feet. They're not the worst people in the world. Uh, yeah. they're, they're running it. It's not got a real issue with the clients, but we need an alternative. Yeah. So glad, thrilled you're providing one. And uh, what you're again just saying there leads me to how can people support 
the IAPF? Um, so, I mean, we're, we're a not-for-profit organisation registered um, to receive funds in South Africa, Australia and the United States, operating in Kenya, um, Zimbabwe. Uh, we train rangers from uh, Uganda, uh, Malawi, Tanzania, um, branching into Mozambique. So we, we're basically covering East and Southern Africa. Um, but, um, yeah, if people want to get on our website and have a look, iapf.org. Uh, they can decide if, if what we're doing is uh, is worthwhile supporting or, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be us, it's, but, it's, it, but it is about finding something to support. And whether that's visiting Africa and, and investing in, uh, in travel organisations that in turn put their money back into conservation mm-hmm. uh, or finding, it, finding an organisation that suits them, doing their research and, and, and then getting in behind them, speaking about it, learning more about conservation, learning about what we can do to change our daily habits, to make them less destructive uh, to, to this one sort of beautiful backyard we've been given, then uh, and that's that's a step in the right direction. Yeah, I think that's it. The, the, you, you've spoken a bit about social media and I have a similar mindset. In, yeah. I'm on it quite a bit. I'm incredibly frustrated by it. the internet activism. Those mm. that's an oxymoron. Yeah. Liking something, clicking it, posting a black and white picture yeah. does not achieve anything. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm yeah. just impressed by people that try. Whether they succeed yeah. or just trying, you're immediately doing so yeah. much more. And then you spoke about the, the the peak of the mountain for us is someone like Jane Goodall who's been achieving yeah. for yeah. more decades than you or I have been alive. It's really quite it, – it, it, that's always been someone right to that and thought – Gosh, that's a high mountain to climb to to just keep going as she does. Yeah. Uh, with grace. She's so graceful. Yeah. Extraordinary. Yeah, she is a... Um, yeah, we all, you know, we all, I mean, we all talk about, you know, what do you want in life? People say they want to be happy and, and you know, for in, in a way, mm-hmm. you know, it's almost the, the, the purpose of life. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Whether you're running a company, you're trying to make money, have a family, when you're doing it right, you, you, it feels good. So, you know, let's just say the purpose of life is having a good time, being happy, the only thing is we can't destroy the place in the meantime. Otherwise, there's going to be nothing left. So it, it, it's got to be a two-way street. You have a good time, set out to achieve your goals, set out to be successful, whatever, but just put something back, you know. Put in more than you take out. If, if you're aiming yeah. for that, that's surely yeah. a good thing. Um, so here's a one. With your job being high stress from the times when you were being shot at at a regular occurrence, I imagine, um, as you said, now it's it's the stress of trying to preserve great tracts of land. What do you do to unwind? Uh, you, you're not allowed to laugh, but I work. Uh, so the less I work, <laughs> I, I did laugh. The less I work, the more I stress. So the, no, no, it's, it's um, no, I do. Um, but I'm passionate about what we do. I don't I don't work the the sort of sixteen hours a day now that I used to, but. Uh, Usually, if um, if something stresses me out, I you know get into it and get working. But uh, you know, I've, I've unintentionally created a, a role for myself and is the head of this organisation that I, I have to travel to a number of countries and continents around the world each year and get to speak about something that I'm passionate about. I get to spend time in the bush, uh, both with our projects and scoping new projects. So uh, you know, there's, there's there's not too much that I'm missing out on. I don't have a lot of material possessions myself. I mean, the organisation has sort of scaled up quite big, uh, but uh, I could I could narrow my possessions down into a backpack pretty quickly and uh, be on the road. And yeah, yeah that's that's how that I like to live. So, yeah. I mean, you, you've spoken of new projects with Mozambique coming on. Did did you do a, a little yes? Because that means you get to spend time underwater again. Uh, I went swimming with a whale shark the other week and just swam along oh, for about forty minutes with it. Just yeah. Loved it. Um, but, uh, for me, as someone that, that's grown up in the ocean, spending more time in, in it than out of it uh, as a kid, it's um, very exciting to be able to go back and, and put something back into it. What, what's the poaching issue there that you'll be dealing with? There's a, there's a lot of uh, illegal fishing and, and, and overfishing okay. and then the stuff that's happening offshore. Uh, yeah, there's also some very very important mangrove systems. Uh, you know, collectively, the world's mangrove systems hold more carbon than the entire Amazon put together. So these are these are important areas. Uh, more than fifty percent of our, our oxygen that we breathe on this planet comes from the ocean. Uh, so look, it's mm-hmm. it's something that um, 
Then I asked Paul Watson, head of Sea Shepherd, says, when the ocean dies, we die. So, yeah, um, yeah there's, there's going to be a lot of work to do there. But, um, you know, we, and again, we're looking at areas where there's nothing, nothing happening. Uh, there's a very, a very interesting law that's just been passed there that allows coastal communities to designate their own maritime protected areas. So um, we're working with some, uh, okay. closely with some scientists is, over there. Is that similar to the conservancy system you have somewhere like Namibia? Uh, well, yeah, well, similar to, to I, I would imagine, how you have the campfire system, so areas held okay. on the communal land trust in Zimbabwe yep. um, or, or in Namibia. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's, it's going to be very slow, uh, you know, doing all the paperwork and MOUs and all that to get in there. But, um, you know, something that, um, you know, the areas that we've we've isolated to to be scoping, um, there's nothing going on. There's a lot of work to be done and uh, there's a lot of room for expansion over, over the coming years. Great. Well, it's a, a tradition we have on, it's probably too young to be called a tradition, deep in the bush, and it's been going a few weeks. Something that we want to make a tradition is that we finish everything with some good news. I think we get a bit bogged down in the bad news out of the conservation world. What's some good news you can share with us? Ah, okay, yeah, good news here. Uh, so we've just started a training course. We've got 31 new rangers on that training course, uh, 31 women from uh, the local community there. We've got another 80 that have just gone through selection about to start training here. So uh, that for us is exciting uh, when you hear about the backstories of these women, where they came from. And you see the other women that have gone through uh, several years before them that have that have transformed their lives around. It's um, yeah, that's something special for me. And when I come up here, enjoy uh, enjoy seeing seeing the progress of those women and the potential of the others. Um, yeah, it um, it makes you feel good about what you do. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so I urge everybody have a look at the IAPF website. Very just search IAPF. It is the first result that will come up on Google for you. There's an amazing video on there that's going to take up 13 minutes of your life. I believe it was produced by James Cameron. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, James Cameron and Nat Geo. So yeah, just yeah. So there you are. There's, there's some, you know, tiny, tiny people, <laughs> tiny people in the world of Hollywood. Um, but a fantastic thing about the work that Damien and the IAPF are doing. Have a look at that. Um, very very simple to donate. Please do it. It's that or a cup of coffee. I think is the standard thing given. Uh, Damien, thank you so much for your time, taking out time when you could be out in the field there. I, I wish I could climb through the screen and wander off into that bushland with you. Um, but we'll chat again soon, and hopefully I'll see you someday in Big Falls soon. Awesome, Peter. Thanks very much, mate. Thanks, Damien. Cheers, bud. Ciao.